I'll record now. Hopefully it'll stay there. Okay. Welcome to the mythology of Judaism. This is, I think, a wonderful subject. Obviously, I, if I didn't think it was such a wonderful subject, I wouldn't be involved in it. Uh, and so I'll just jump right into the presentation. So subjects, dates, and topics. Uh, Tuesday nights, uh, the next five Tuesday nights, counting tonight, from February 2nd to March 2nd. Second, the, the subjects that I have planned uh, tonight, I hope to get into Lilith. Uh, and we're going to discuss the Shekhinah. We're going to discuss hell. We're going to discuss Messiah, Adam and Eve, and Angel of Death. Maybe. I have no idea how far I can get into this. The real issue is just, you know, how long it takes to, uh, to cover the material. So we're, we're going to see. I'm glad it's stable. Okay, a word from my sponsor. I think I saw Sherry coming into the room. Uh, I am I am conducting this um, program because I am the community rabbi for the Jewish Federation of Ventura County, uh, who has been supporting me uh, in this role for, for quite a few years. And uh, if you go to my website on the classes page, you will see a link uh, where if you feel moved to, uh, to donate, uh, uh, in support of this work, you can donate to the Federation. And for copies of text and recordings of sessions, you can go to my website. So you go to the website, there's a picture of me. Uh, if you click on the thing that says classes, you will see a list with lots of classes that I have taught and videos, uh, YouTube videos of the various classes. So for this particular class, there's a place to register. And again, you don't have to register if you don't want to. The, if you register, then you'll be on my mailing list to send out notifications for the classes and texts for the classes. Also, what I'm going to do is post the full text. I'll say more about that um, in, in a minute for every one of the texts that I'm going to discuss. And then I will also post recordings of the classes. And I'm just going to double check and make sure I'm actually recording. And yes, I am. OK, good. OK, so here is a question. And Jay, this I wrote this with you in mind, because every time we discuss some wild and interesting texts, the question arises, do you really expect me to believe this? Do I have to believe this? And the answer is no, you don't have to believe this, OK? So don't ask me if you have to believe this. The answer is no, you don't have to believe this. And I will repeat this as often as necessary. And I suspect it will be more than just a few times. Now, if you have other questions, and I know there will be other questions, so just in case I don't get to all of them, here is the answer to every other question. The answer is God knows. So if you have a very difficult and, and, and complex question that you want answered, the simple answer is God knows. And um, you know maybe I'll try and take on questions other than, the, other than this. Um, so the key text is this book. Uh, it's called The Tree of Souls. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, it's, it's pretty expensive. I'm not sure if it's really in print. But the nice thing is, uh, I don't know how well you can read this, at least when I prepared this slide on Kindle, it was only like 13, yeah, $13. So it's not terribly expensive and it is a wonderful resource. In this book, for each myth in the text, it has a, a lot of material. So I just wanna illustrate the kinds of thing it has and the kinds of myths, so this is a myth I'm not going to talk about God's crown of prayers. Three times every day, the prayers of Israel ascend on high. When all Israel has finished praying, what happens to their prayers? I bet you wonder about this, right? You're praying. What happens to your prayers? They thread their way to paradise, to the highest heaven, where they are gathered by the angel Sandalophone, an angel appointed over prayers. Sandalophone collects all the prayers that have been offered in all the synagogues and weaves them into garlands of prayers that he places on the head of God to wear on his throne of glory. That is why it is said God is crowned with the prayers of Israel. 
So that's the substance of the myth. And I'm going to be reading a lot of texts like that. But one of the things you should know, and I most often won't get into this kind of commentary, but um, Howard Schwartz, who is the preeminent scholar of Jewish mythology, also has a commentary. So I'll just read a little bit to give you an illustration. I know for depending on what kind of screen you're looking at, it may not be so easy to read. The idea that God wears a crown is a natural development from the concept of God as king. Since kings were the highest, most powerful human beings, God was viewed as the ultimate king. So too does God have a throne, the throne of glory and a crown. The notion of God wearing a crown is also reinforced by the biblical verse and a splendid crown upon your head. And then it goes on. The other thing that I love about uh, Howard Schwartz's book is it has all of the sources. So if you're moved to dig into some of this material, you'll at least have a sense where it is coming from. So this complete description, I will be posting in the text on my website. Every text I use, I'll post not only the substance that you'll see on the screen tonight, but also all the commentary. Um, oh, and someone asked in, in, the, uh, in the chat, what is my website? Really easy, it's just lotker, L-O-T-K-E-R dot com. There are a lot of myths. So I've just took some screen grabs from the uh, table of contents uh, in the opening. Uh, let's see, uh, here, this is just the myths of God. There are like 68 uh, myths of God. Um, whoops, sorry, I wanna go in the right direction. So the book is 618 pages long. The table of contents is 20 pages long. There are 670 individual myths cited. The introduction is 54 pages long and has 172 footnotes. You will either love this or you'll be horrified by it. So, you know, you, you pay your $13 to Kindle and you take your choices. The glossary in the back is four and a half pages long. The bibliography of sources is 11 and a half pages long and cites more than 500 sources. And the selected, and I think the word selected is hilarious in this context, English bibliography is 42 pages long and cites some 1,500 sources. I want to give you a sense of why I adore material like this. And again, I, I, I discussed this with someone so with, a, with a much smaller group uh, last night. Either you'll love this or you won't. So this is actually from Abulafia, a 13th century mystic. The purpose of marriage of a woman and a man is union. The purpose of union is fertilization. The purpose of fertilization is giving birth. The purpose of birth is learning. The purpose of learning is to grasp the divine. The purpose of apprehending, of deeply understanding the divine is to maintain the endurance of one who apprehends with the joy of apprehension. So those of you that have 2000 books may get this. The purpose of studying here is the joy of deeper insights into the material. You're not gonna get a certificate, you're not gonna graduate, you're not gonna get a grade. The purpose is to live in what is for me the ecstatic joy of insights into the nature of the divine. And no, you don't have to believe the stories, but understand that the people writing these stories believe them. There's another wonderful quote, I quote Abraham Joshua Heschel all the time, uh, and he writes, the Greeks learned in order to comprehend. They wanted to understand things. I'm gonna switch here. Modern man learns in order to use. Modern man learns things in order to use. I'm trying to learn how to use Zoom for a lot of people, share screen, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a, a new microphone that works a little better than the old one. So but for modern man, the key question is how useful um, is this material? The Hebrews learned in order to revere. For Jews, for our tradition, 
the purpose of learning is to be in awe. So that's the underlying theme of this. And it's also really fun. Somebody's raising the question, can you define myths? I will define it in a second. Another thing about Jewish spirituality, which is important to understand and bear in mind, is that Jewish spirituality begins with the study of sacred texts. The presumption and the understanding is our sacred text, Bible, I didn't, a Bible, Talmud, Midrash, Zohar, I'll be introducing lots of texts and lots of other texts, have in some sense have been inspired by God and they are infinitely deep with meaning and wisdom and insight. So why do we keep reading the Torah over and over again? You know, there's a saying, the question is not how many times you've been through the Torah. The question is how many times has the Torah been through you? Why do we keep reading the Torah over and over and over again? Because every time we read it, we get another glimpse of what God had in mind in, in these stories. Um, I, I like to think of it like a love letter from God. Imagine you're on a desert island. Um, you know, a couple of you are on a desert island uh, in, in your, uh, in your uh, virtual backgrounds. Um, and you only have one letter from the deepest, truest love of your life. You read it over and over again because you're not going to get another letter from, from that person. And so if the, a letter is big or underlined or misspelled, or, or, you know, or said in an odd way, instead of just saying, well, it's a typo, you're going to really dig into, the, into what was my love trying to teach me by saying the, the message this way. That's how we read these texts, and you'll see it. Uh, and in Judaism, words are things. The same word, devarim, that means words also means things. There is nothing more real in Judaism as words. Words are very important. So how will we approach this subject? We will approach this subject by reading lots of texts. And that's what Jews did. We focus on texts as brilliant minds that we've developed in Judaism. We didn't focus on a lot of things. We didn't focus on great art. We didn't focus on fantastic sculpture. We didn't focus on wonderful architecture in Judaism. We didn't focus on building great armies. Jews focused on texts and intensive study. This, I think, is an old um, uh, Migilat Esther, Scroll of Esther, and a Talmud and collection. And this, this is a, I don't know if you can read it, it's a 400-year-old Jewish library that survived Hitler and the Inquisition. And so the result of this tradition of, of study are some great Jewish minds. So we have Einstein, great physicist. We have Jonas Salk, a great medical researcher. We have Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, a great uh, jurist. We even have some great comedians, brilliant minds. Okay, so not all the Jews were so brilliant in their... Uh, in their, uh, in their background. These are the three stooges. I'm not sure they would be called brilliant in any context, but I couldn't resist. Um, and so that's what we Jews do. If you look up at old at pictures of Jews, you know, Google Jews or rabbis, and you'll see a, a lot of old men studying, uh, pouring, spending their lives over text. And of course, today it's not just men doing this. And this was a fun one. This is a photograph of one of these big TV screens at a soccer stadium in Tel Aviv where the rabbi has taken his family to a soccer game. But since that wasn't terribly interesting to him, he's reading a little Talmud, uh, I guess, while things are, are getting a little dull. The approach that I want to take is to give you a taste of the depth and breadth of the material. The, my approach is scholarly, not pious. I don't insist that you believe that the texts are God-given. When we have Torah study, where often uh, you know, people will, will say, well, didn't this and such and so happen? And the answer is sometimes it's Midrash, not originally Bible or Torah. So I don't insist that you believe it, but you should understand that our tradition treated these texts 
as God, as, uh, as God given. So they paid a lot of attention to them. And that's why they've had such an impact on Judaism. And I'll mention some of those impacts in a moment. So somebody asked for a definition of mythology. Um, and this is actually from, um, from Schwartz's book. Myth refers to a people's sacred stories about origins, deities, ancestors, and heroes. Within a culture, myths serve as the divine charter and myth and ritual are inextricably bound. So it's certainly easy to see how Torah and Bible, they are clearly our stories of origin as a Jewish people, um, and how they provide stories of origin, discussion of God, our ancestors, and our heroes, as well as serving as our divine charter. You know, in the Bible are lots of stories, and you know, you know, you're familiar with them, but clearly also in the Bible and in the Torah are lots of, um, are lots of laws about how we should conduct ourselves. And so once again, I will just mention um, as we go on, if you have questions, just type them in the chat, and I have the chat window open, so hopefully I'll be able to to see them as they occur to you. So I just wanted to highlight some of the ways in which these myths and stories affect our practice. So you know about Shabbat and Havdalah, and I was thinking specifically about Havdalah. Um, you know, one of the things we do on Havdalah is smell the spices. And you may wonder why we smell the spices, though this is in response to a myth uh, that on Shabbat, we get a neshama yatira, an additional neshama, an additional soul, a Sabbath soul that accompanies us during Shabbat. And at the end of Shabbat, that soul departs to go back up to wherever those souls go, heaven, presumably. And so to comfort our body uh, from, the, from the pain of losing the soul, from the, from the discomfort, from the agony, the sorrow of losing this, this uh, neshama yatira, we smell the spices and that comforts us. The mourner's Kaddish, I think all of you who are Jewish are familiar with the mourner's Kaddish. And the fact that we say it during Shiva, we say it um, you know, in the period right after someone has died, and we say it uh, repeatedly on the anniversary of the person's passing. This has to do with the myth uh, uh, of the journey of the soul from this world to the next world. And the understanding is that the Kaddish, which is mostly Aramaic, praising God in the name of the person who has departed, that journey is assisted uh, in, in its progress from this world to the next world by people praising God in, uh, in the departed's name. At the Passover Seder, we reenact the story. I mean, we could just read the Bible and, and you know, read about Exodus, but the Seder really takes the mythology, the stories in the Bible, and amplifies them by getting the versions that are in the Talmud. And then, as you know, we reenact the story. We don't say, well, there were slaves. We say, avadim hayinu, we were slaves. We eat the bread of slavery, and then we transform that bread of slavery into the, um, into the bread of freedom. Um, we eat foods that remind us of, of, the, of the story, bitter herbs, salt, water. Uh, we have actions opening the door for Elijah. There's a whole mythology about this huge mythology about Elijah, um, uh, Chametz, Afikomen, and so on. Lots and lots of, 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 uh, of reasons. My point is these myths enter our Jewish practice. Uh, tashlik, very, the rabbis have been uncomfortable with Tashlik for about a thousand years. Uh, this idea that we can get rid of our sins by casting breadcrumbs uh, into water on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, sounding the shofar on on Rosh Hashanah, one myth says that when God hears the shofar, it causes God to get up from God's chair, which is the throne of, of judgment, uh, and justice to move over to the throne of mercy. Um, the pilgrimage holidays. In the Bible, uh, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot are agricultural holidays. The Talmud expanded them by, um, by having myths 
about them being historical holidays as well as just agricultural holidays. Mythology in Judaism. And I do see questions are coming up and I will pause in a moment and, and address some of them. Uh, there, there is a wide array, a huge array of mythological figures and they are understood to be aspects of the Godhead. So this is a sort of an insight and an attitude that I would say is not something we're very used to. So I, I sometimes just think of it like this. Um, the philosophers like Maimonides living about a thousand years ago, about 800 years ago, um, very much followed Aristotle with the idea that God is purely spiritual. God is not physical. God doesn't have an arm. God doesn't have an eye uh, and, and so on. In mythology, particularly in Kabbalah, the rabbis go, or yeah, the Kabbalists go overboard in the opposite direction. So instead of having no image of God, they will have dozens and maybe even scores and hundreds of different images of God with the idea that each one of these images give us a little more insight into the nature of God. I don't believe they should be taken literally. I think they should be taken poetically. So all of these creatures, the angels and so on, the dark side and the light side, gods you'll see it. We're going to get into God's male aspect and female aspect. Uh, um, are aspects of the nature of God, of the Godhead. Uh, Schwartz in this book has 10 major categories. Myths of God, creation, heaven, hell, the holy word, holy time, holy people, holy land, exile, and the Messiah. And, and the, his book is organized into these 10 sections. And we don't have enough time in five sessions to even begin to cover them. Judaism's foundational myth, if we have one central myth in Judaism, the foundational central myth in Judaism is that we are in a covenant with God. A covenant with God is almost a quasi-legal arrangement that God has undertaken certain representations and promises to the Jewish people or to, or to all humanity, and we, the Jewish people, therefore have an obligation to God, and both sides are bound by it. This is a radical change from um, concepts of God. You know, if you look at the Greek gods, the Roman gods, uh, Egyptian gods, they play pranks, they rape, they steal, they, they do all kinds of crazy things. I know some of you in, in your notes registering for this class are, are far more knowledgeable about mythology than I. In Judaism, the idea is God is just, is rational, and God is actually bound to God's own principles and the terms of the Brit, the covenant that God has entered into with the Jewish people. Um, and then the myths just go on and on, and they aren't all consistent with each other. So, you know, in reading the introduction, uh, Schwartz mentioned there are more than 100 creation myths in Judaism, more than any other kind of myth. The rabbis were interested in the stories of creation. I want to spend some time talking about the Midrashic method in Judaism. Uh, many of you, I, I, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me just pause and look at some of the, uh, some of the questions that, has, uh, that have arisen. Someone asked, why do we say Kaddish for only 11 months? We'll see that when we talk about hell. The, the, I would say the, the predominating myth about the punishment in the afterlife is a place of punishment called Gehenna. And the idea is, unless you've committed some absolutely horrible sin, you're only in Gehenna for a maximum of one year. And you will be all delighted to know that you get Shabbat off. We'll actually read that myth uh, sometime in the next few weeks. Um, so once, once a week for Shabbat, you get to leave Gehenna, take a little break. Uh, you actually, um, uh, my East Coast friends will ha happen to know that it's hot in, you know, in Gehenna, but you can pile up some snow and bring it back with you into Gehenna, if I remember that myth correctly. 
Um, and you're only there a maximum for 12 months. So you say Kaddish to help your loved one, parents, you say Kaddish uh, to help your parents while they're in Gehenna to hopefully get them out quicker. Um, and you say it while they're there. Now, why do we say it for 11 months rather than in 12 months? Well, you don't want to make a public statement to your entire synagogue community that is, listen, I know mom, I know dad. They are going to take every last day to pay for what they did. Uh, so, And you don't want to say, well, my parents are saints, uh, so they're only going to be there for 10 minutes because, you know, who knows what they really did. So that's why we say Kaddish for 11 months. Uh, what is the concept of higher levels in the afterlife? Uh, makes me think of Neoplatonic contemplation, but that came a lot after the Jews. It may have come a lot after the Jews, but not after the the dates of these texts. So these texts and Midrash will be influenced by these ideas, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually see a discussion of that, of the higher levels. Uh, avatars is a question. I don't know what's meant by that question. Can you comment on the observation that there's a connection between myth and behavior? Yeah, I mean, one example is we have a myth about how long you stay in Gehenna, and that leads to Jewish law, which says you should say Kaddish for your parents for 11 months. Um, what's the spectrum of Jewish beliefs that the Holocaust broke the covenant? Um, what I would say is probably most people would say that the Jews broke the covenant. Um, what one of my teachers, Yitz Greenberg, says about the Holocaust is that it ushers into a new era of the relationship between God and the Jewish people. And I'll just digress for a second on that. What he says, and Yitz Greenberg is a liberal Orthodox rabbi, which makes him unusual to begin with. And what he says is in the first sort of period of Jewish history, God is clearly in charge. So this is Torah, this is Bible, God's splitting seas, God's giving manna, God's giving water from the rock, God's doing all kinds of great miracles. Once the, and that takes us up to the point where the temple is standing and then the temple is destroyed. Once the temple is destroyed, uh, Rabbi Greenberg says, that by and large, the rabbis are in charge and God is not in charge. And there's a wonderful story in the Talmud, I, I don't think I have it in this, in this class, where rabbis are arguing about a point of Jewish law and God shows up and says, no, 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 do it this way. And the rabbis say, who asked you? I mean, you've, you've had your shot, you gave us revelation, you turned over to us the job of making Jewish law, uh, mind your own business. And God's response is to laugh and say, my children have bested me. So that's the second phase when the rabbis are by and large in charge. What um, Rabbi Greenberg says with the, with the Holocaust, um, the covenant, the basic outline of the covenant has entered another stage where by and large Israel is in charge, my people are in charge and the rabbis no longer set the rules. Uh, people are going to do what people are going to do. And that's certainly the subject of a, of a long discussion. Okay. Midrash. Midrash comes from the Hebrew verb lirdrosh, which means to draw out. So the basic idea is when we read the biblical text, we often find that questions arise. Anybody that's ever been to Torah study knows this deeply. You read the text and questions occur to you. And probably if they've occurred to you, they've occurred to other people as well. So by digging into the text, the authors of Midrash, typically rabbis, are trying to come up with explanations of these sort of inconsistencies, uh, challenges, and, and questions. By the way, I'm delighted to announce that there are 76 screens on. So that's, thank you so much for the honor of coming, the honor you do me if, in coming. So I wanna give you an example of Midrash uh, and why the problem arises and how um, the rabbis address these problems. 
and I think some anybody that stu that studied the opening description of 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 Genesis of the creation of the universe notices that on the very first day God says let there be light and there was light but the sun the moon and the stars weren't created until the fourth day this is just simple reading of the text so the obvious question arises what was the light on the first day that is different than the light of the sun and the moon and the stars so I just have a couple of, of examples of how the rabbis address that. Isaiah, now we're, we're in the Bible again, has a prophecy about light in the messianic era, leading the rabbis to conclude that the light of the first day and the fourth day are different, that the light of the first day is hidden, or ganuz, or the light of paradise, it's described, seven times brighter than the sun. So we have this somehow unique light that was created on the first day. And then, you know, speaking as a physicist, I might say the light was condensed on the fourth day into stars, you know, uh, sun, uh, sun, stars, and of course, moon is a reflected light. So where did this primordial original light go? Um, Job has a line, uh, Job, book of the Bible, but now one does not see the light, it shines in heaven. So the rabbis are going to, the rabbis will take things out of context. That's, I will admit to doing this myself, that's what we do. We will find a little piece of scripture, even though it's clear if you go back to that scripture, it meant one thing in the scripture, we're going to turn it around, maybe even change the spelling, and learn fantastic lessons from it. So the rabbis are going to look into this uh, Job quote. So they say, well, God removed this light, uh, some say after 36 hours, and hid it away, that organ news, so it shines for the righteous in Olam Haba, the world to come, the world of, of after you die, the world of the Messianic era. Some say that that light lasted until Adam and Eve ate the fruit. The Zohar teaches that whenever the Torah is studied at night, oh, we're studying Torah at night. Remember, Torah means more than just the first five books of the Bible. Um, the hidden light, uh, a single ray comes from the hidden light and stretches forth to those who study. So look around at a source of light that is now shining on you in your room where you are. Maybe it's coming from the screen. That light was, that's the light of the first day of creation. It's hidden and it appears when you study Torah. You're really getting it out of the brilliance of the Torah. Um, you may have heard the words uh, Zohar. Zohar means radiance and splendor. Uh, Rabbi Nachman of Braslav says the light is hidden in the stories of Torah. Stories of Torah are nice, but the rabbis say, you know what? If they, if they just didn't have any deeper meaning, we could write better stories, okay? Stephen King writes really good stories. Um, this hidden, the, in the Torah is hidden depth and light. And another rabbi say the light is not hidden at all, but only the righteous can see it. So I won't ask for a vote of how many of you can see that light. Okay, so we're doing pretty well. I want to jump into our first connection of, of, um, of myths, and that are the myths about Lilith. So just reading here from this uh, image, uh, according to some, the demon Lilith was Adam's first wife, and she was absolutely terrifying. And here's Lilith enchanting some poor guy. Lilith is a great example of the Midrashic method and how the understanding of Lilith has changed through the centuries. To the point, I think many of you know now, for Jews, particularly Jewish feminists, um, Lilith is an example, and, and we'll see why in, in a few minutes. She was sort of independent and stood up to the, to the male hegemony uh, and, you know, contradicted her husband. So the Jewish feminists really like her, and there's a, a magazine which is still published called Lilith, but that's a fairly late development, as you will see. So what's the problem in the biblical text? that gives us the reason of why we need Lilith. Here's the problem. 
in the first chapter of Genesis, I think it's Genesis 1, about 26, uh, God creates humanity, male and female. Uh, God says, let us make Adam, the human, in our image, male and female, he created them. So in Genesis 1, first chapter of Genesis, we've got a man and we've got, we've got an entity. I want to be very precise with my language. We've got an entity that is male and female, okay? Not 100% clear what that entity is, but we've got, a ma we've got male and female. Everybody with me? Um, then in the second chapter of Genesis, beginning in verse 4, all of a sudden, we're in the Garden of Eden, and God creates the human out of the Adam, out of the Adama. It's a pun in Hebrew, out of the, the, the earth, the dust of the earth. And clearly, Adam is male because there's a whole story about searching for, for his Ezer Kinegdo, uh, a partner, and uh, doesn't find it among the animals. By the way, there's some, Rashi has some interesting stories about, I, I hope there are no children here, I can't see all the screens, uh, about Adam having, uh, trying sexual relations with the animals in the Garden of Eden and, and not, uh, not being uh, happy with that. Uh, anyway, if you read the text carefully, Rashi actually quotes this. This wouldn't come from, from my you know, pristine mind. It was, it was Rashi uh, that made me do it. So, uh, so, and then, of course, you know there's surgery on Adam. It's very interesting and not at all clear about what part of Adam's body is used to make the woman. And so that, then we have a male and a female. So the question is, what happened to the first female? Uh, the Jewish mythology identifies her as Lilith. Lilith doesn't appear in the biblical text at all. And that mythology has grown and grown and grown over the centuries and keeps growing. So the, um, I'm going to quote some of the texts, but, but to summarize, um, Lilith is expelled by Adam for disobedience. And the story, and you'll see it in, in one of the texts, is she refuses just to be on the bottom during text during sex, she wanted to be on top. Uh, I don't know why this upset Adam. I, maybe I, I shouldn't comment any further on this. Uh, but anyway, it did. And so she, uh, she is expelled. Um, mythology then starts pursuing the question of, well, whatever happened to Lilith? And it turns out she's taking the demons on, taking demons on as lovers, okay? Creating... Um, generations of demons. And some myths have her stealing the seed of mortal men during their nocturnal emissions and creating a breed of half human, half demonic creatures. And we'll, we'll actually read some of those myths. She becomes a queen of demons who is a threat to the lives of babies unless you protect the babies with an amulet. And you'll, you'll see an example of what should be written on this amulet. Uh, and in modern times, as I mentioned, she becomes a role model for Jewish feminism. Uh, and today, Lilith is a quarterly magazine uh, for Jewish feminism, uh, published first in, uh, in 1976. And once again, if you have questions, just type them in the chat, and I will keep an eye on it. So we're going to begin, after I take a drink of water, uh, with some myths about Lilith. This is what a lot of this class is going to be. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm not going to just ask for people to read. I think it'll work better if I just read it. And I hope you enjoy it. Adam and Lilith. When God created Adam and saw he was alone, he created a woman from the dust. Remember, this is before Eve. We're now still in chapter one of Genesis. Like him, created a woman fr from the dust, like him, meaning Adam, and named her Lilith. But when God brought her to Adam, they immediately began to fight. Adam wanted her to lie beneath him, but Lilith insisted that he lie below her. It's, pro it's a power struggle, I would say. Uh, when Lilith saw that they would never agree, she uttered God's name and flew into the air and fled from Adam. Adam prayed to his creator, saying, Master of the universe, the woman you gave me has already left me. So God called upon three angels, 
Senoy, San Senoy, and Sem, Sem Angelov. I mean, I, I don't know how to pronounce these angels necessarily, to bring her back. God said, go and fetch Lilith. If she agrees to go back, fine. If not, bring her back by force. The angels left at once and caught up with Lilith, who is living in a cave by the Red Sea in the place where Pharaoh's army would drown. Sort of an interesting historical connection. They seized her and said, your maker has commanded you to return to your husband at once. If you agree to come with us, fine. If not, we will drown 100 of your demonic offspring every day. Lilith said, go ahead, but don't you know that I was created to strangle newborn infants, boys before the eighth day and girls before the 20th? Let's make a deal. Whenever I see your names on an amulet, I will have no power over that infant. When the angels saw that it was best that they would, that this was the best they would get from her, they agreed. So long as 100 of her demon children perish every day. That is why 100 of Lilith's demon offspring perish daily. And that is why the names of the three angels are written on the amulets hung above the bed of the newborn children. And when Lilith sees the names of the angels, she remembers her oath and leaves those children alone. Somebody, uh, Cheryl asked a question, how do we know the angels' names? I don't know. Um, more mythology. There is a, a um, many of you know the books by Maggie Anton. She wrote three books uh, in the series, The Daughters of Rashi. Uh, I don't think I'm looking to see if I have it. I think I gave this book to, to uh, I sent this book to somebody else. Um, she's now started a new series about the early stages of writing the, the Talmud. And I can't remember the name of the book, but um, it is all about the sort of magical um, amulets and, and bowls that are written with names on it and smashed and incantations. And again, medieval Jewish history as described in the Talmud is filled with this stuff. I, somebody asked, are amulets with an angel's name sold somewhere? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, you may have you know, heard that. And when you go to Israel, um, you're walking down the street, people will try and put a red string on your wrist. And your Rabbi, thank you, thank you, Gigi, Rav Chizda's Daughters. And I think, I think there are two books out at the moment, and I'm not, I think she's working on a third one. Um, I, I might get, I don't know the earliest reference uh, to Lilith. And I do think that this has the source of the red bendel. Robin asks about on a baby's crib. There's also a red ribbon from the story of Joshua invading uh, um, Jericho. People hung a red ribbon. So you have all of these things and uh, Lilith's amulets are on sale at Etsy. Get it now before the class is over for special protection particularly those of you who are about to give birth. I'm trying to see closely and it doesn't look like anybody is at least in active labor. Um, okay, and this is Alpha Beta de Ben Sirah, and I don't know, uh, you know, even the dates of that, but my guess is this is pretty early. Okay, this is a fun one. And for extra credit, I'm gonna see if any of you recognize how this practice may relate to modern times. The seller and the source here, boy, there are a lot of sources. So, I mean, I just want to highlight, I know you can't see this. And remember, I actually sent a, an email to most of you, everyone who sent me your email address, I sent you an email, a pretty long, with, with an attachment of a PDF of all of these texts. So uh, every text I'm using here is in that, um, is in that email. So here's, you know, maybe, seven or eight different sources for the for this myth. So Schwartz has compiled them. By the way, Schwartz has about 15 or 20 books on Jewish mythology. I heard him speak once and he's a wonderful speaker. And so I, I got this book. Every impurity engenders demons. Whenever a man's seed is spilled, his demon offspring are conceived. Lilith or one of the daughters of Lilith steals it. A drop is all that is needed. These demon sons regard the man as their father. They find a place to live in his house, whether in an attic or a cellar, or even in a closet. They make their home there. 
Not even married men are safe from the lure of Lilith. No sooner do the wives turn their backs than Lilith seeks out victims among them. She appears to them in dreams during the night and as visions during the day. Sometimes Lilith so sways a man that she becomes his secret wife. This is what happened in the city of Posen, where once there was a goldsmith who was secretly married to Lilith. The demoness lived in the cellar where the goldsmith had his workshop. He spent time with his demon lover every day while keeping her existence secret from the family. Little by little, the goldsmith yielded everything to her, lusting after her day and night. Once it happened that the goldsmith even got up in the middle of a Seder, in the middle of a Passover Seder, when the words, and they went down to Egypt. So I can almost imagine this. They say they went down to Egypt, and he said, uh, excuse me, honey, I'm going down to the cellar. And we're red, and so he went down to the cellar. His wife followed after him, afraid that he was ill. She peered through the keyhole of the cellar door and saw that the cellar had been transformed into a palatial chamber while her husband lay naked in the arms of a lover. Maintaining control of herself, she returned to the Seder and revealed nothing to the rest of the family. But the next day she went to the rabbi and told him everything. The rabbi confronted the man with his sin and he confessed. Then the rabbi gave him an amulet to protect him against Lilith, and he used it to free himself of her. But before she would release him, Lilith demanded that the seller be bequeathed to her and her demon offspring for all time. And the man took a vow to this effect. He escaped her powers all the rest of his life. But as he lay on his deathbed, his demon children swarmed around him, invisible to his human family, crying out his name. After his death, the house became known as being haunted. Eventually it was sold and the new owner had a workman break open the door to the cellar, which had been nailed shut. When, the work, when that workman was found dead on the threshold, Rabbi Yoel Baal Shem was sent to investigate. He confirmed that the cellar was infested with demons and he ordered a rabbinic court, a Beit Din, to be convened. The court ruled against the demon's right to live in the cellar on the grounds that the demons transgressed the boundaries of the cellar and they were expelled into the wilderness. Now, I think you all recognize that this is a fantastic story. I mean, the idea that a guy would leave his wife and go into some secret room to be seduced by images is of course preposterous and bears no semblance to uh, modern times or reality. Uh, so one reason why I like this story. So um, a blue chamsa on, on, so someone says, uh, my dad made me put a blue chamsa on my son during Mila. I've never heard of that custom, but the idea of an amulet when your life is at risk or threatened, you know, is, is, is very common. I mean, again, most of you particularly, well, I would say not just the Ashkenazim, uh, know of, of the evil eye and, and the word kenahara. Kenahara uh, deals with basically is 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 a, a, a Yiddish way of saying can can ayin hara um, that you want to keep the ayin ayin means I hara evil from the scene that you want to be protected from the evil eye. In Islam, the the hamsa is a symbol that comes into Judaism out of Islam. It's actually the hand of Fatima. I think it's Muhammad's daughter-in-law, and often there is an eye in the center of a chamsa. You can all look at your chamsa out and see um, um, if there's an eye in it. But, it, but basically it's a, it is a Muslim symbol which has the same idea. Um, you know, people are observing the myth between myth and fable is, is thin here. Yes, it's very, very thin. I'm actually just tracing what happened. We're starting with a problem in the Bible. I, I, I don't want you to uh, to lose sight of this. We're starting with a Bible. We're starting with a problem in the Bible that there was a female in Genesis 1 and she seems to disappear in Genesis 2. So the question is, whatever happened? So she becomes Lilith uh, because she disappears. She must have done something wrong. And so 
the rabbis are going to keep cooking up these stories. And they, you know, those of you that are talking about these amulets, um, you know, have uh, show that, that these stories in various forms still govern our lives. You can argue that a talit is an amulet. We, we tie the, the strings in a certain way that remind us of the commandments. Um, much of this seems like simple superstitions. They don't seem so simple to me. Um, and what I would say, which really is an important part, is in, I would say, certainly in reform and conservative traditions, the reform and the conservative rabbis were embarrassed by Kabbalah, were embarrassed by mysticism. So you have uh, Gretz, uh, who wrote a huge six-volume history of Jews and Judaism. There is one paragraph in that entire story, uh, entire history about Kabbalah. In the conservative seminary, the, the great scholar of Kabbalah is, is Gershom, Gershom Shalom. Now I can't remember his name. I think it's Gershom Shalom, but uh, I just can't remember. Um, and he was, he was, I believe, a professor in the conservative seminary and was very well respected. And the head of the, of the seminary said, um, Kabbalah is narishkeit. Narishkeit is a Yiddish word, which means foolishness. Kabbalah is foolishness. But the study of Kabbalah is scholarship. Um, I'm just going to take a look at some of the other comments. Um, yeah, I would say they're, they're Gershom Shalom. Yes, I, I don't know why I, I just couldn't think of, of that name. So there is definitely a trend here. These stories are written by men and the men are reading them and you have the right to get angry. You know, when I have, I, I studied Talmud with a wonderful Talmud teacher, Judith Abrams of blessed memory. And uh, she would at the beginning of every study session basically make this point these are misogynistic. They were written by men for men. They discriminate against women. Everybody pound your table, you know, for five seconds, get it out of your system, and now we'll go read. We, we do have to understand, you know, where this comes from. Let's see, I think I have a few more Liliths, and then we'll close this session. Lilith and Elijah. Elijah was walking one day when he met Lilith. He said, unclean one, where are you going? Lilith knew she could not lie to Elijah. So she said, I'm going to the house of a woman who is about to give birth. I will give her a sleeping potion and kill her and take her child and eat it. So for those of you wondering why you didn't study this in Sunday school, uh, that might be a clue. Elijah said, I curse you in the name of the Lord. Be silent as a stone. Lilith said, O oh Lord, release me from your curse. And I swear by God's name to forsake my evil ways. As long as I see or hear my own names, I will retreat and not come near that person. I shall have no power to injure him or do evil. I swear to disclose my true names to you. And Elijah says, tell me what your names are. And Lilith said, these are my names. And I'll try and pronounce them. Lilith Abiti, Ab Abizu, Amrusu, Hakash, Od, Ayal, Matrut. Ta, Avgu, Kata, Kali, Batub, and Paritasha. Let them be written and hung about the house of women who are bearing a child or around a child after it has been born. And when I see those names, I will run away at once. Neither the child nor the mother will ever be injured by me. And Elijah said, so be it. Amen. Um, so one of the things that I would say about this is child death in childbirth was quite common during these times. It was common that children would die and it was not so uncommon that a mother would die. In fact, in an alarming passage in the Talmud, they are referring to something bad that happens quite often uh, so we should understand, even though it's bad, it happens all the time and we have to deal with it. And the example that they use of something that's bad that happens often is the death of a child in childbirth. In fact, as you may know, that in traditional Judaism, 
you don't go through full mourning, which is to say a funeral and shiva and, uh, and complete mourning rites that are traditional in Judaism, if a child dies within the first 30 days of the child's life. And the reason is a very practical one. During these times, it was so common that if you didn't do this, everyone would be in mourning almost all the time. So what I can see here, and certainly you see it if you read Maggie Anton's books, is this sense that horrible things are happening and how can we get control over these horrible things? And so they didn't know the wisdom, you know, the new scientific knowledge of injecting bleach uh, as a way of getting rid of these problems. So they, they had to come up with other magical ways of, of solving these kinds of problems. So they would, they would come up with these systems and I can almost imagine, you know, again, if you read Maggie's books, you'll see that there were people who were, who were wizards at this and they would create these amulets and they would create these magic spells and presumably sometimes it would work and they would get a reputation so these, these concepts would, uh, would, you know, would, would catch on. Um, uh, just glancing. Lilith is the forebearer, someone is writing, of the blood of the lamb on the lintels of Jews' houses in Exodus, so the angel of death. So I would say the, the idea of an amulet of a protective um, element certainly has to do with the blood on the, on the doorpost. And it's not just any blood, it's the blood of, of, of a lamb or a ram, which was a god in Egypt. So what was going on in that story, slightly below the level of, of the simple meaning of the story, is the Jews are being told to slaughter a god of Egypt and sprinkle the blood of the god of Egypt on the doorposts. Um, uh, and that would protect uh, them. And basically, it's a very public way of saying, uh, I don't believe in, in the gods of Egypt. Uh, I believe, you know, in, in the God of the Israelites. And in fact, you know, as I, I, I've observed many, many times, that every one of the plagues is actually aimed at one of the gods of Egypt. Um, what is Lilith is a Hebrew word. And I think it's mentioned somewhere in the Bible, not very much connected in this story. And I just don't remember where, but I, I do recall reading it in, in Schwartz's book. Okay, now we're gonna have some more fun with Lilith. Lilith becomes God's bride. After God dismissed his bride, the Shekhinah, from his presence, um, I would say next time we're gonna get into a lot of discussion of the Shekhinah as God's bride, as the feminine aspect of God. Um, and so the understanding is that when, when the temple is destroyed and the Jews go into exile, Shekhinah is, in biblical Hebrew, Shekhinah is the presence of God. Presence of God where? The presence of God on earth. The word Shekhinah is a feminine word, words that end in a, like Shekhinah, like Torah, are feminine. Hebrew is a gendered language, like Spanish or French. Uh, all the nouns are either male or female. In the Bible, they really don't pick up on the feminine nature of the word Shekhinah, but the mystics are going to pick up on it big time. So the understanding is the Shekhinah is God's bride. When the Israelites go into exile, God's presence goes with them. Who is God's presence? The Shekhinah. So it's almost as if God and the Shekhinah uh, have a separation. And that's, we'll see that when we read texts on the, on the Shekhinah. So after God, dis so this, this text is from uh, the Zohar. Uh, uh, so after God dismissed his bride, the Shekhinah, from his presence at the time of the destruction of the temple, God brought in a maidservant to take her place. Who is this maidservant? She is none other than Lilith, who once made her home behind the mill and is now the servant, and now the servant is heir to her mistress, as it is said, a slave girl who's, who supplants her mistress from Proverbs. Remember, a lot of the Midrashic method, the rabbis are always going to dig into the Bible for touchstones and inspirations to these stories. 
She rules over the Holy Land as the Shekhinah once ruled over it. Thus the slave woman has become the ruler of the house and the true bride has been imprisoned in the house of the slave woman, the evil Lilith. Uh, there the bride is held in exile with her offspring whose hands are tied behind their back wearing many chains and shackles. So it's an image of the Jews in exile. If Lilith is ruling over the earth, Shekhinah is in the earth, Lilith is ruling over Shekhinah and ruling over the Jews who are enslaved, we're in, we're in uh, Galut, we're in, in the diaspora. Uh, this is a bitter time for the exiled bride who sobs because her husband, God, does not throw his light upon her. Her joy has fled because she sees her rival, Lilith, in her house, deriding her. And when God sees his true bride lying in the dust and suffering, he too will become embittered and descend to save her from the strangers who are violating her. So it is that in the days to come, the days to come, news will come to God's consort, Lilith, that the time has come for her to go. Then she who plays the harlot will flee from the sanctuary. For if she were to come there when the woman of worth was present, she would perish. Then God will restore the Shekhinah to her place as in the beginning, and God and his true bride will again couple with each other in joy. As for the evil slave woman, God will no longer dwell with her, and she will cease to exist. So one of the things we're going to see in stories about the Shekhinah is It is not right and appropriate that God's male and female aspects, that God and the goddess should be separated. That separation occurs, um, at least in most of these stories, that separation occurs with the destruction of the temple. Basically, that's God's bedroom. We'll see very graphic description of God's bedroom with his Shekhinah and of their lovemaking both when the temple stood and what happens when the temple is destroyed. Um, this is not the way it should be. In, you know, Bayom Hahu, in those days to come, when the Messiah comes, the Messianic age is here. Um, the Shekhinah and God will once again be unified. Temple will be rebuilt and the world will be as it should be. There's also allusions in the commentary on this uh, those of you who are really uh, into Torah study will see allusions to Sarah and Hagar, where Hagar is Sarah's maidservant and then becomes, you know, very uh, aggressive or uppity or, or uh, you know, boastful because she has a son and Sarah has yet to have a son. So there's a disruption there. And so the, the, no doubt this story is informed by that idea. Okay, so I just want to close with uh, some images of Lilith magazine. Here's the first issue. Uh, here's a later issue, another issue, uh, and the 40th anniversary issue. Um, I want to see. So next time we will begin, it's about a quarter after eight, uh, we will begin with the myths of the Shekhinah, uh, the bride of God. And there is a wonderful um, book of photography by Leonard Nimoy, Yes, that Leonard Nimoy, um, called Shekhinah. And it's really some very interesting, I would say, erotic photography. Not all erotic, uh, but let's just say I had to place this little text box strategically to, uh, to uh, try and keep this, uh, this presentation PG rated. And of course, you see the woman here is wearing tefillin. So you can imagine how well received this book was uh, by the Orthodox establishment. I am going to stop sharing. Ah, there you are. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to see uh, one more question. And maybe I will take the risk of letting you uh, ask questions. We'll just see how that goes. Is the coupling of the male and female aspects of God metaphorical? Or is there some idea of God and Shekhinah actually happen having physical pleasure i would say it's mythological so if you want to say that's metaphorical uh you have the right to to say that i would say the the authors of these stories are taking these ideas very very seriously and so they're trying 
my understanding of this is they are trying to help us understand the nature of God by addressing the sexuality of God and God's male and female aspects. And so is it metaphorical? I would say it's mythological. Um, I would say, you know, I wouldn't take these stories literally, just as I don't take Torah literally. I don't take the story of Adam and Eve literally. I don't take the story of Noah's Ark literally. But, I, but it's an, it is a foundational myth for Jews and Judaism. Okay, it is a quarter after eight, and um, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to leave. You have the right to go to sleep. I know it's a quarter after 11 for some of you, but if people want to ask questions live, I'm just going to see how this goes. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. I am delighted to say we still, we had like 76 people right up to the end. Some people are leaving and that's fine. So if anybody wants to make a comment, I, I'm still recording. Uh, maybe I'll stop recording. So people might feel a little freer to, um, to make those comments.